So it's wonderful to be able to preach. Pastor Marty did a great job launching Joseph, our series on Joseph last week. He talked about when dreams turn into nightmares and how God, even in a messy family dynamic, can still bring about his plans, even though the person may feel like they are the furthest possible away from that plan becoming a reality. And what we're going to do is turn to the next installment of our Joseph series today. We're looking at Genesis chapter 39. We're going to dive right in because there's a lot happening. So Genesis 39, if you've got your Bible, then flick it open, have a look on your your app, download the Bible app. You can do that and read along with us so that you can look at it later and, and keep into the Word of God. And so Joseph is sold by his brothers into slavery. And that's where we pick up in Genesis chapter 39, verse 1. It says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favour in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. And from the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. I mean, I've never had that spoken about me in any way. (laughs) Seriously. Who wrote this? Joseph. Joseph was well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he's entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And and though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. And one day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants were inside. And she caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out the door. And when she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream for help, he took his cloak and uh, left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home, and then she told him the story, that Hebrew slave you brought to us has come to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of his house. And when his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how this slave has treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him, put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him, and he showed him kindness and granted him favour in the eyes of the prison warder. So the warder put Joseph in charge of all of those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that he was done there. And the warder paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care, because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. It's a very spicy chapter of Scripture, isn't it? (laughs) It's one of those passages of Scripture you look and go, wow, it's like the first ever reality TV show, like (laughs) The Real Housewives of Egypt or something. I don't know. Just crazy, spicy stuff. Have you ever done a timeline, a life timeline exercise? You know what I'm talking about, the life timeline exercise, where you you plot your life, the, the most memorable moments in your life? And, and, and it's, in a, it's a, way, a way that you can reflect on, on the Lord's movement, really, in your life and how you've matured and grown. Well, I, I don't know you real well, Nita, and I've just sort of started connecting in. But if I could guess your timeline, it's impossible to say that there's a normal life timeline, but let me have a crack at it. Your timeline might look something like this. You were born at a young age, pause for laughter, and went to school. You developed at school a heart for something. Uh, an aptitude for something that you were really, really good at. 
And so you stuck with it, you went to church, and in the sense, you had God sort of compelling you to explore more about it, whether that meant that you went to university or that you started a work in, in a trade or something like that, it doesn't matter, but you were working in the calling that God had given to you. And so while you were working and you were really, really good at it, you met the man or the woman of your dreams, probably at the 5.30 service um, <laughs> at, at Fernie Grove. And then you met your life partner and you got married and you did pretty well for yourself. You went and you, you, you got a job and, and you did pretty well in your job. So you, you, you were able to purchase a house and then not be able to pay it off because of all the rate rises. You ended up doing pretty well and you, you, your kids were, grew up and, and then they got married and you could even manage somehow to go overseas for a few visits. You traveled overseas and you joined us, another line on your life's timeline. You came back with so many wonderful memories that you shared and bored everyone who would listen about your overseas trip. <laughs> and as you look at your life timeline, you can see moments where you experienced different types of calamities, trials, different types of things. Maybe you lost a loved one, or there was a, a particular ailment that you had to, to deal with. Maybe you had to bury one of your parents. It was a very difficult time in your life, but you reflected really well in faith. And as a result of this calamity, you got through stronger and wiser as a result. You lived to a ripe old age, leaving your kids and their grandkids and possibly their grandkids. That makes you a great, great grand person, but that's okay. Your grandkids, the family home, a unit on the coast in a well-worn caravan with a life filled with memories. I mean, doesn't that just seem like the dream life? That's the life that everyone would kind of want. And if you're living that life, hallelujah, praise God that that's your story. But I want you to consider Joseph's timeline. Joseph's timeline looks completely different. He started really, really well. He had a terrific start, a wonderful platform, born into a patriarch, Jacob's household. He was the 11th son of Jacob, and he was loved by his dad more than his other brothers, so much so that Jacob even gave Joseph a cloak almost to rub in his brother's faces. He gave him this cloak, and for some reason his brothers resented his uh, Joseph for being the favoured person, but not only that, Alongside of Joseph's favourite status was his arrogance in his youthfulness. That he was given a dream, boasting that God would make him powerful and a famous ruler, where his family, and in fact the world, would actually come and bow down before him. And this fueled the jealousy-type rage in the brothers, and they planned to murder Joseph. Even though he was only 15 to 16 year old, they relented and ended up selling him into slavery. And then transported from his home, Joseph was moved into Egypt, away from his parents. He didn't know the language and he had all his rights and privileges removed. And yet, even in his bondage, he showed promise. And as he was promoted, he was given more responsibility even diligently managing an official's estate. It was at that time, and this was another mark in the timeline that was an experience for Joseph. Unfortunately, he was accused of attempted rape and despite being innocent, was sentenced to jail. And this is where Genesis 39 finishes, right here. And his timeline's only half complete. Now, if that was the end of the story, you'd go, that's a pretty rough, that's a rough life, isn't it? Now, we know that Joseph spends somewhere between 10 to 15 years as a slave or in jail. Some people say that he spent up to two decades in slavery or in jail. And we know, looking that the story continues on for Joseph, that Joseph, he may have lost his forecasted future. We've got the benefit of hindsight. We can see that God had Joseph exactly where he needed to be, right there. God ends up promoting Joseph to prime minister to save the people of Egypt. We know that Joseph gets married, ends up having two children, 
does become successful, does become wealthy with power and prestige and position and even reconciles to his family. But at this point in his life's timeline, Joseph didn't know any of that, what was to come. And yet we know that God was doing something incredible. First of all, we know that Joseph saved his family from a devastating famine and preserved the people of God from whom the Messiah would come. Joseph didn't know that, but God knew that. We also know that Joseph's move to Egypt took place to incubate this fledgling people of God. Where 75 people moved to Egypt and over 400 years grew to a nation of 400 people and becoming a nation themselves. And we know from Joseph's story that he transitioned the people of Abraham from patriarchal family with a covenant of 75 people localized in a region to becoming a nation and claiming an inherited land. All of that took place in Joseph's life. And this tells us something, that in your life's timeline, if you are looking at your life right now, and it seems so far away from the God-given dream that you believe he's given to you, friends, don't lose hope. God is not done with you. If you are praying for your marriage to be reconciled, don't lose hope. If you are praying for your kids to come back to the Lord, don't lose hope. If you feel like you are so given over as a prisoner to sin, no matter what you've done, it can't work, don't lose hope. God isn't done with you. Your timeline is only half done. Hallelujah. God's got more for you. Don't lose hope. Joseph didn't lose hope. Don't lose hope. The second thing that this tells us is that when you see Joseph's situation, Joseph would be used miraculously. He would be used spectacularly in his life and in his timeline. However, God isn't just interested in what Joseph can do. He is interested in who Joseph is becoming. God isn't just interested in the wonderful ministries that you will lead and the life that you'll... He's interested in the inner maturing of your God-man inside. He wants you to become like Christ. Another way of saying this is that God isn't just interested in what you do for him, but what he's doing in you. And Joseph, in preparation for what was to come, needed to go on this inward journey of maturity to prepare him for everything that God had for him. And how important is this, folks? If you've looked at the news over the last five years, how many Christian leaders have fallen from grace and succumbed to the pressures of temptation? Ravi Zacharias, Bill Hybels, Carl Lentz, real people of God who are gifted by God and their gifts and their potential took them to a place that their maturity couldn't sustain them. And God is more interested in our inner maturity, not just our outward delivery of Christian service. Amen? And so for Joseph to be of use to God in the, the wonderful mission, he needed for Joseph to grow up. He needed that inner maturity. And that's what Genesis 39 is really about. In order for him to lead the people, he needed to grow up into becoming the person of God that he was called to be. And so today, one of the ways that we see Joseph becoming mature and becoming a man, ready to lead the people of Israel, he needed to triumph over temptation. And Genesis 39 is the chapter about overcoming temptation. And no doubt this story is very, very familiar to all of you, but I found it interesting for the first time as I was preparing this this week, that the word temptation isn't written anywhere in Genesis chapter 39. Did you notice that? We actually don't know if Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife. Rembrandt uh, did this wonderful artistic masterpiece back in 1647, uh, I think it is, and it's too spicy. It falls, 
It falls in that weird gap between being too spicy for church, but it's really not that spicy at all, but I probably couldn't show it to you. And he painted this picture uh, from 1647 about Potiphar's wife and Joseph. And, And in this picture, it's got Joseph completely repulsed by Potiphar's wife. And Potiphar's wife is depicted as lying, lounging on a couch, half naked. Well, now that I say it out loud, I mean, it is a bit dodgy. But half naked, you don't see anything, half naked. But she's like a a devouring monster. And there's nothing about her that looks flattering. And so I like this picture because it it shows a different angle to this story. That maybe, maybe Joseph wasn't tempted by sexual opportunity, but... But there are plenty of other ways that people get tempted, aren't there? People get tempted to lie and steal and gossip and slander and feel tempted to be cowardly and standing up for your faith and your convictions and who you are in Christ, like Peter, on the night that Jesus was killed. There's plenty of ways that we can get tempted. And I heard this week of this story about a man who was on a diet and he was really struggling on his diet. And every day on the way to work, he would go to the same cafe and get the same coffee. But unfortunately, or maybe it was good marketing, the bakery next door sold the best donuts in town. And so he felt tempted when he was getting his coffee to go and get one, two, three donuts and take them into work. So he's driving into work and he prays. He goes, oh, Lord, if you don't want me to get a coffee and probably a donut, then I'm just praying that there are no car parks out the front of the cafe. And that way I'll know that you said, no, the temptation's too great for you, and so keep driving on the way to work. And so he's going along, and then he arrives to work, sure enough, and he's got his coffee and half a dozen donuts. And he said, sure enough, I found a parking place right out in front on my seventh time around the block. (laughs) He got there. Nailed it. So some people struggle with the sexual opportunity Some people struggle with overeating, some people struggle with lying and stealing and all of those kinds of things. So we're going to look at today adopting four strategies to triumph over temptation. Not just sexual temptation, but triumph over temptation. Four strategies, okay? The first one is the longest one, the rest aren't as long, the first one's the longest one. The first strategy to triumph over temptation is to first of all, recognize it for what it is. Recognize it as temptation. And it's easier said than done. You see, Joseph recognized the opportunity to sleep with Jezebel Potiphar. That's how I named her in my head, Jezebel Potiphar. He recognized the opportunity to sleep with Jezebel Potiphar, and he saw it in verse 9 as a wicked thing. He saw it straight away. Now, keeping in mind that, that Potiphar was an Egyptian official and likely a eunuch, they may have had some kind of an agreement when Potiphar wasn't home that his wife could Jezebel anyone. I don't know. And yet Joseph sees this as a wicked thing, even though the world may see it as permissible, he saw it as a wicked thing. Joseph identified quickly that God was with him. God brought him success. You heard that four times in Genesis 39. The Lord was with Joseph four times. Why would he jeopardize and sin against God by doing this wicked thing? Joseph quickly recognized it as temptation. And temptation is like a big juicy piece of bait on a giant hook. If you can imagine those old bear traps, you know, those steel clamps, you put your foot in and it just takes your foot and And it keeps your foot in a vice until you come and and, and you bleed out and die. If you saw this beautiful piece of bait in one of those, but you saw the bait, you'd go nowhere near that trap. You've got to recognize it for what it is. I've got a picture up on the screen. I like fishing. It's one of the things that I like to do. And this is a big jew fish. It's about a meter long. Now, I say it's about a meter long because it sounds better than 90 centimeters. But it was about a meter long. And I put three gang hooks. So if you know what fishing is, you get a hook, another hook, another hook, and you kind of gang them together, and you put this big irresistible piece of bait that Jewfish apparently can't 
ignore. They love it. They're drawn to it. And I did a YouTube search to find out how to do it best. And it says that the bait, regardless of how good it looks, if the fish see the hook, they don't go anywhere near it. And so the whole idea of catching fish well is to address the bait. And the same thing happens with temptation. Joseph recognized the bait, but also the hook leading him potentially into wickedness and sinning against God. The first way that we can triumph over temptation is to recognize it. And so I'm going to run us through really quickly what the Bible says temptation is and what the Bible says temptation isn't. What temptation is and what it isn't to help us recognize. First of all, temptation is different to trials and testings. Now, in the New Testament particularly, the same Greek word is used. Did you know this? For trials, temptations, and testing? It's the word pyrissimos. And there's another word that's attached to it, pereo. I think that's the way it is, Andrew. Is that the way you say it, Andrew? You don't know? I don't know. And these words are used interchangeably in the New Testament for trials, temptations, and testing. So when Jesus in Matthew 4 was taken into the desert, it's peresmos. He was tempted, trial tested by Satan. But because Satan was the instigator of it, it isn't a test or a trial, it's temptation. For example, trials are a difficult life event that all people experience because of the fall. The awful tragedy over in Turkey and Syria. Uh, the pandemic that we experienced recently, accidents that happen, they are trials that happen because we live in a fallen world. They're different to tests. A test is a deliberately set out opportunity for us from God to reveal the depth of our character in order for us to grow in our inner maturity. You might say that you are the greatest chef in all of the world, but if you haven't been tested, it's untrue. You might say that you are a son and daughter of the Most High God, but until you put that into action in moments you need to, it's untested. God provides opportunities for us to be tested in our faith, to strengthen and grow our inner man. And trials and tests are very different to temptation. Temptation is birthed by Satan. We know this because in the garden, it was Adam and Eve who were tempted by Satan. And Satan's temptation is to try and lure us away from the paths of righteousness, to participate in rebellion against God. That's what temptation does. It's the tactic of Satan to get you to disobey God, to entrap you, to imprison you, to bind you up in sin so that you will suffer shame, defeat, sin and death. Temptation is anti-God altogether. God doesn't tempt anybody. Satan tempts us. But Satan isn't the only instigator of temptation. We are also compelled towards sin because of original sin. It's empowered by our flesh. In James chapter 1, verses 14 to 15, he says, each one is tempted when he or she is carried away and enticed. We get carried away by these unmet needs that each one of us have. And when the temptation comes and we see we can take this opportunity and engage in this unmet need and meet this unmet need, it's like Satan brings that out in front of us and it's connected to the next one. The way that we meet our unmet need is to engage in a distortion of God's perfect creation. For example, sex is something that God has created. It's God's idea and it's awesome. Yet, temptation is where Satan lures us away from exploring that unmet need for physical sexual intimacy outside of God's preferred context of marriage. You can have this mead net if you disobey God and follow the enemy. It's a distortion of God and his blessings. And the thing is, temptation promises more it can deliver. It promises the earth but leaves us empty and desolate. I've had this song in my head the whole week by Crowded House, Into Temptation. And so I listened to it. I don't know if you've, you've heard that song recently. It was written by Neil Flynn. And I actually don't even know if, if Neil was a Christian, but it matches up brilliantly with Proverbs 7. If you read Proverbs 7 and listen to this song, he says, you opened up the door. No, I won't sing it. I couldn't believe my luck. 
you in your new blue dress, taking away my breath. The cradle is soft and warm. Into temptation, knowing full well, the earth will rebel. Into temptation, safe in the wide open arms of hell. Experience is cheap. I should have listened to the warning, but the cradle is soft and warm. See, temptation promises the earth but leaves us yearning for more than what our unmet needs can possibly get given through this experience. So temptation is nuanced. Satan knows your bait. He knows how to get you, whether it's sexual sin or overeating or whatever it is, he knows how to get you. He knows our hooks. He tried to allure Jesus away by tempting him in the desert, by appealing to his humanity if you eat this food. He appealed to his desire for success and comfort if you just worship me. He tried to lure him away from fulfilling the agony of the cross, his messianic calling. And it shows us that temptation is indiscriminate. Every single person everywhere will experience temptation, even our Lord Jesus. Hebrews 4.15 says that we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. There's one person who's experienced temptation and didn't succumb, our Lord Jesus. And so when we look at what the Bible says temptation is, it doesn't look very attractive to us right now. It's good for us to look at what temptation is not. Really quickly, temptation is not from God. James 1.13, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. We've got to recognize, is this the Lord bringing this out, or is this an opportunity for Satan to lure me away from the presence of God? Temptation in itself is not sinful. Jesus was tempted in every way, and yet was without sin. Being tempted is not the same as actually sinning. And temptation is not more powerful than God. The the desire to engage in the sinful activity is very strong because it's it's dopamine. You've, You've heard of dopamine. Dopamine is part of God's created order. And God has created you and I with this chemical called dopamine. And it's called the reward center of your brain because it releases hormones to reward you when you do the things you need to do to survive, eat, and drink, and compete, and reproduce. And all of those things contain in themselves some pleasure. Now, people can get addicted to the addiction of dopamine and experiencing the flood of dopamine. And those with addictive personalities and backgrounds know the power of dopamine, and it can feel extremely strong, like a compelling pull towards engaging in sin. Miriam Brown, I don't know if you've heard of her, she's a very well-known Brisbane psychologist, Christian psychologist, and she says that dopamine has a power that's limited, you won't believe this, to two minutes. It's at its strongest for two minutes. And so when the flood comes, of dopamine comes, and that sensation, that strong desire to engage in sin, it's at its strongest, like a huge peak, for two minutes. And if you can get through two minutes, it gets a lot easier to overcome. Dopamine is not stronger than the Lord Jesus. He created dopamine. He created us in this way. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. For when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. I did a study this week. I had some free time. I went through the scriptures and found times when people were tempted, but God found a way out. So when Cain, before Cain murdered Abel, he warned Cain. God warned Cain and says, The enemy is, is, is crouching at your door. He warned him. He warns Nebuchadnezzar. When Nebuchadnezzar was tempted to stand up and, and proclaim that he was like God, he even warns Judas before succumbing to the temptation to hand Jesus over for 30 pieces of silver. God always provides a way of escape. And so the first way to overcome temptation is to recognize it, what temptation is and what it isn't. And once the hook is revealed and you see it for what it is, or the steel trap's exposed, you wouldn't willingly go on after it. You wouldn't willingly put your foot in it. 
And so we recognise, first of all, that temptation is from Satan. Don't go near it. Now what? And that's the longest point. I'm going to run through the last three very, very quickly. Triumph over temptation strategy number two. Once you recognise it, it's important for us to devour the Word of God. The Word of God is your weapon. And it's connected to the first source. Because how are we going to know whether this is of God or Satan or the flesh? We need to know the Word of God. And I'm not talking about doing your little one verse a day sort of stuff and then going and reading everything else, but build your life on the Word of God. Let the Word of God remain in you so that you know the Word of God. The reason why this is important is because faith in God comes from hearing the Word of God. Faith comes by the Word of God. Peter writes to us saying, stay alert, Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Resist the enemy and he will flee. It's no accident that when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the desert, he uses the word of God to resist the enemy to stay strong. Now, there is a template, and I want to show this to you really quickly, particularly young people, because... This is something that's really important to flee the evil desires of youth. But for all of us who are wanting to grow in that inner journey, this is really important. In in 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 to 14, there's this lovely poem. Beautiful. John writes it. Let me read it. He goes, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven on the account of youth's name. I'm writing to you, fathers, mothers as well, who are spiritual elders, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I've written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who was from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, young women, growing in God, because you are strong, and the Word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. The template to overcoming the evil one, to be strong. The Word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Anyone who's done anything for the Lord has gone on this journey. Overcome the evil one can happen by being built on the Word of God. Garbage in, garbage out. Allow your life to be built upon what Jesus says, not what the world says. Amen? Not good enough. Amen? Amen. Yeah, you better wake up. Strategy number three, and I got a bit angry on this one. Sorry, Pastor Marty. I'm not an angry person. I'm very relaxed. But show some wisdom for goodness sakes. To overcome and triumph over temptation. Get some wisdom. Don't let pride become another bit of bait for you to chew down on because you're too proud to ask for help. Get some wisdom. In Joseph, in chapter 39, verse 10, after Jezebel's Potiphar's attempt to lure him to bed to seduce him. Verse 10, she spoke to Joseph day after day, but he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. He would nowhere near her. That's wisdom. And when she eventually tricked him, he ran away. He literally ran away. That's wisdom. And it says to us, friends, that if you are struggling to stop drinking, stop walking past the pub. If you're struggling to stop Eating and overeating, don't get your coffee near where the the, the donuts are. If you're struggling with sexual temptation, there's a person at work, there's a person around, don't spend time alone with them. You know, one of the wonderful privileges I've had was spend a week with uh, Will Graham, Billy Graham's grandson. We spent uh, two weeks doing an evangelism tour about 10 years ago through, through Queensland and, and New South Wales. And he shared the story, and this is a well-known story of Billy Graham, that Billy Graham, you know, the, the evangelist, the guy, millions of people came to faith through his ministry, he would never be alone with a woman, not because women are unsafe, but because he knew himself. He always travelled with his wife, Ruth, or a, a male friend, He would never walk into a room first. That's wisdom. And in light of the the significant fallings of Christian men and leaders, 
It just makes sense to me, doesn't it? If you, guys, if you're looking at pornography, show some flipping wisdom and put something on your devices or on your phone to stop you from doing it. It's as simple as that. I'm not too proud to say that on my phone I've got a passcode so that if there's a search or anything that happens, it restricts me from accessing it and the only person who knows that passcode is my lovely wife. I have people around me who ask me deliberately, how are you going in these areas? Show some wisdom in order to triumph over temptation. Are you with me? If you're not involved in a small group, if you're not accountable, if you're unknown to people, you are literally the person that Satan's dangling that hook in front of you. You're not meant to do this life alone. Get some wisdom. Read Proverbs 7 about how um, there are these, this woman, I won't re- read it now, but this woman who's trying to lure people in because they weren't accountable. Didn't have anyone around them. That's the third strategy. The last strategy is the last one. I'll get um, Fee, if you can come up with the band, that'd be great. And the last strategy is the first strategy in order to triumph over temptation. See, Joseph did really well with Potiphar's wife, but the real strategy to overcome temptation is to receive Jesus. Jesus is your strategy. He is the power you need to fill you up and meet these unmet needs that we all have, that each one of us have, but he is the person also who proves he has power to overcome temptation. See, Jesus faced all temptations and overcame them, so he shows us that he has power. But Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, was deeply tempted, and I believe this was the struggle in Jesus' life when he prayed, Father, take this cup away from me. He could have succumbed to the temptation to avoid the cross, but he didn't. Jesus submitted himself to cruel nails. And it was Jesus who was subjected to agonizing torment by enduring hell on the cross. And he died once and for all. But he died not because he needed to be saved, but because we did. We can't resist all temptations. We will fall. We will succumb to sin at some point. And what Jesus has done on the cross is he's taken away the punishment for that. And not only has he taken it away, he's taken away your condemnation. He's taken away your shame so that when the enemy points at you and says, you are nothing like this, this so-and-so and so, go and participate in this evil behavior. You tell him to get lost because Jesus has taken away your shame and he has given you everything you need to overcome temptation, to overcome the enemy. On the cross, Jesus took on punishment. He took on hell in himself. So that when we do stumble and fall, we have somebody whose cloak was stripped off him. We have somebody who was sold into slavery, who was murdered and imprisoned and condemned, but not because he did something wrong, because we did. And he takes our place. And so when we do stuff that Jesus himself comes And he restores us and equips us. Amen. Wow, what a saviour. Why don't we stand and um, let me just pray. Lord, we, we have no strength in ourselves to overcome temptation. And dear Jesus, we thank you that you've given us everything we need to do this. And I would pray for my brothers and sisters right now that those who are far from Jesus would be reconciled to him right now. In Jesus' name, would you come and place your faith in him? Receive his life into yours. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. It's not about trying to keep score and matching up good versus bad. It's all bad. Jesus is good, and we take his good in our life when we receive Jesus. Wow. And so, Jesus, we would pray you'd take away our failings and our shortcomings, and we say, thank you, you've done that that you've made us brand new. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. We pray, Lord, for wisdom for the men and women and children in this place, that you'd show us how to walk after you, Lord Jesus. We pray, God, that we would be simply infatuated with the word, 
that we would build a, a hunger for the Word as a source of life to overcome the enemy. And Lord, that you'd give us the power to recognize temptation for what it is, a lure to, to take us away from living your, our best life in you. I want to pray this on our brothers and sisters here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen.